Thanks so much. Well, good morning. Uh, let's go ahead and stand and as we sing this hymn of heaven. How I long to breathe the air of heaven. The pain is gone and mercy fills the streets. To look upon the one who grabbed to save me. Walk with him through all eternity. There will be a day when all will bow before him. There will be a day when death will be no more. Standing face to face with he who died and rose again. Holy, holy is the Lord. And every prayer we prayed in desperation the songs of faith we sang through doubt and fear in the end we'll see that it was worth it when he returns to wipe away our tears there will be a day just declare uh, that, that you are great and you are mighty and truly you are holy and we stand in your presence amazed and in awe of who you are we uh, pray uh, as we look at your word together that you would reveal your truth to us that we could respond to your truth out of obedient and loving hearts we pray these things in Jesus name amen and you may be seated for just a few minutes and uh, you know I want, I want to go thank you for being here today. Some of you don't have any choice, okay? But uh, we've got some guests here, and I appreciate them being here this morning for the last day. Well, we don't have school tomorrow. We're out tomorrow. Uh, good day for you to do work and catch up if you need to. So uh, think about that. And I'm going to go ahead and say now we still have some food left from Tuesday. Eat lunch here if you want to. It'll be out. Or if you want to put some on a plate or a couple of plates and take to your apartment, that's fine too. We just hate to not use all of the food. So today we have Justin Coburn, who's going to be our second speaker. Justin is Secretary Treasurer, Missions of the American Baptist Association. And I just want you to hear, uh, I want you to hear what these, like we've heard already, what these men do, what their involvement is, uh, the ministries that they're working through. So he'll speak after... Wayne Stringer, Brother Wayne Stringer, speaks, and uh, I know I know both these guys real well. I know their hearts are dedicated to their work. Wayne's a Brother Wayne's a 
graduate of TBI. Did you graduate? I know you're smiling at me now. He's a graduate of TBI. And just, uh, six years. yeah, six years. But they, they do, all of these men we've heard this week are amazing in their ministries. So that's what I want you to hear. Because guess what? God may touch your hearts to do some of this. Hope he does. All right? All right, Brother Wayne, come on up here. And when you're done, just kind of tell this guy to get up and speak. All right? That clock back there. <laughs> Let me have that mic. You can move? All right. Okay. It's ready to go. All right. Okay, I am Director of Promotions for Philippine Mission Development. Uh, my sponsoring church is White Rock, just down the road out of center. Philippine Mission Development is kind of a unique ministry. It's something that uh, is 20 years, actually it's 20 years old. I, you know, God prepares you for what he wants you to do if you're willing to listen to him or just be submissive to his will. That's all he wants is you be submissive. He'll lead you. I never in my wildest dreams realized or thought that I'd be working with churches in the Philippine Islands when I surrendered to the ministry, even when I sat uh, here and uh, we didn't have comfortable chairs like that when I was here. Uh, but anyway, uh, I did graduate from here. I attended or pastored First Baptist at ARP for a number of years. And uh, when I went to Westside, New Boston, they had a national missionary. And for the next 10 years, I worked with churches there as pastor. And I realized there was a need and that we were not meeting uh, there in the Philippines, and that was churches that were established in the communities they were working in. Uh, those churches that could show the people there in the community, hey, we're real, we're here. We had no nice buildings in the Philippines when I started 20 years ago, but since then, the mindset has been changed and there are buildings being built that we had no part in. Uh, PMD is helping churches with buildings, but we're more than building buildings. Any ministry, the bottom line, I don't care what you're doing, is to win the salvation of souls. The Great Commission was to go, right? And then you have... Uh, tools to help you uh, do that. The Philippine Islands, most people don't realize it, but it's one of the most densely populated countries in the world. Actually, Manila is 24 square miles, and for every square mile, there's 54,000 people. We, in 20 years, we have established... Well, we've helped. Churches are already there, all right? We're helping establish churches, but we're helping them become uh, recognizable in the community. For some reason, some of the uh, sponsors in the past did not think that it was necessary to have buildings. Lord's coming back, so we don't need to help them with buildings. We have a lot of churches in the Philippine Islands. I mean, there are, uh, at one time, Brother Bill estimated there were six to 800 churches in the Philippine Islands. But our churches failed to become recognizable in the community. And this is what we're doing. We're helping them become recognizable. Uh, this was our first building at uh, Davao. Uh, this was the second building. This was kind of our flagship. When I started, 
We thought we were just going to help them build a building to get them out of the, out of the elements. But when it came time to choose a building, the only one that was accepted that owned property was in Angeles City. And this was the plans they had. And we helped them with this building. It, uh, they now have professional people that are members. Uh, about three years ago, they bought their pastor a new SUV. And now they have members in there that have new cars. They have doctors. They have lawyers. They have professional people. This is number three. Uh, I only have five more minutes, so we're going to run through this real fast. All right. Uh, this was number three. Uh, this was our fourth building. They run on Saturdays. They run now about 250 kids in their kids, uh, children's ministry. They just bought property next door, and they are building a youth center. Uh, this is at Boca Lloyd in Negros. It's the actually the only one of the only buildings that looks like one of our buildings here in the states. We learned right off the bat to let them draw their own plans and it would become their building. Uh, this is at Subic Bay. Doesn't look much like a church house, does it? But it is. This is uh, in Deval. This is uh, the church that met in the old seminary there in Deval. And uh, Brother Teddy Bedillis became their pastor and they moved out. And for the next number of years they met uh, under trees in garages or whatever until uh, we came along. This is number eight. Number nine, Christian Missionary Baptist Church. You like that color? They were Spanish colony for some 400 years and they still have a lot of Spanish influence. This uh, is number 10. Uh, it's one of our larger buildings. Uh, this is also at Deval, number 11, number 12. I want you to notice, I hope you've noticed that these are nice buildings. Uh, they're built out of concrete, uh, steel in the floors and the whatever, metal roof. When it comes a bad storm, a, a tsunami, and it rains and does all of that, they just sweep it out and go on. Before, they just, the buildings were destroyed many times. Uh, this is number 13. This is up above Clark Air Base. Uh, several, I guess last year, two years ago, the Monitor had an article about the uh, old brother Twizon that was martyred up in the mountain. This uh, building here is about a half a mile from where his mission was. That, I wanted to show you. Man, you jumped me all the way to the end. Okay, that's the inside side of that building. And most of the buildings are like that. Okay, this is number 14. I missed 15 somewhere, 16, 18, this is 19. They, we will be doing the dedication of this one week after next. Justin and I are flying to the Philippines Sunday afternoon. This project cost $60,000. We only help with the materials. They're responsible for everything else. Okay, we're working on raising number 20. We're at about $25,000. Well, I missed the slide. But anyway, I was going to tell you how it worked, all right? There it is. They must qualify to be considered, must be an established church. We're not helping missions. 
were helping churches, but they indirectly were helping missions because they're having missionaries over there. They must own property, must be incorporated. Man. Must be incorporated, registered with the government, have prints from an engineer. In 20 years, this ministry has proven itself. Did you pass out those things, Brother Owens? He didn't do it. He went to sleep. This is a couple of our uh, reports. I just wanted you to see them and uh, see what uh, is going on. Any questions? I know that was fast and furious, but I was instructed to be fast and furious. I don't know how in the world I did it and wound up, and it's 11.15. Are you happy? I don't think I'm going to mess with that clicker. I'll just let them do it the way it treated you. <laughs> All right. Uh, good morning. It's good to be here today. And uh, I'm going to invite your attention this morning to Acts chapter 13. Uh, Acts chapter 13, which is kind of the missions uh, chapter. It's kind of the model that we have. Uh, but before we get into those scriptures, you know, I'm reminded of when Peter uh, they had fished all night, and the Bible says that they had caught nothing. And uh, they, asked, Jesus asked them if he could use their boats so that he could do some preaching. And after they do that, uh, Jesus takes Peter and some other disciples, and he tells them to let down their net uh, at a certain place. And uh, Peter, we all know his personality, but Peter said, uh, you know, this doesn't make sense that we're going to let down the net. We fished all night. We haven't caught anything and he uses that word nevertheless. And that word means in spite of what we know. In spite of us being uh, the experts, in spite of our experience that we fished all night and we haven't called anything, we'll do it because you commanded us to. And uh, I have watched both of the lectures um, the last two days and they were phenomenal, but it was kind of centered around God's call for our lives. You know, sometimes God's call doesn't make sense in our lives. Sometimes it's, it really blows our mind at what God does in us and through us and how God uses us. And so I just want, I just want to share a little bit of my story with you and, and, and encourage you, as, as you've already heard, uh, just stay true and faithful to God, and you don't know how God's going to use you. I, I can't imagine... My, me being in the position in God allowing me to pastor the places that I have, to do what I get to do now. Uh, I was a little country boy. We, we grew up on 40 acres uh, in Vows Mill, Louisiana. There's probably one person in here, two people in here who know where that is. Uh, but it was kind of described, you know where the sticks are. This was kind of behind the sticks. That's where I grew up at. Uh, you, you just had to be going there to get there. And uh, the church that, that I kind of grew up in, it was known as the church in the cow pasture. Um, but to, to go from that to, to God allowing me to travel literally all over the world, preaching the gospel, uh, trying to encourage missionaries, uh, trying to promote their works and, and raise support for them, God has a will for every one of our lives. God has a will for your life. Uh, God has a definite purpose for your life. And I think as it was said yesterday, you know, a lot of times that gets us out of our comfort zone. That's where God wants us. He wants us to be out of our comfort zone. Uh, and and uh, as a kid growing up, my father was a pastor. Um, my mom's father was a pastor. Uh, and so I was used to I was used to going to church. I was used to, to uh, live in that life. And uh, on Sunday afternoon, we would come into my grandma's house, and while she was getting everything ready for lunch, uh, I'd get somebody's coat, my dad or my grandpa, and I'd get a Bible, and I would just we'd have a song service, and I'd 
get up and preach at three years old, if you don't trust Christ, you're going to die and go to hell. Uh, I, I, would, I would preach all that. There's tapes of me preaching. Now, as I grew, I, I didn't really think of me preaching and me pastoring. Uh, but when I was 16 years old, God called me to preach. You know what I wanted to be before God called me to preach? And I wanted to be an accountant because math was my thing. And so now I get to work with some numbers uh, as secretary treasurer of missions, and I get to preach, and I get to encourage, and I get to, uh, to do what God wants me to do. And so God is preparing us for, for things ahead of us. God is preparing and God is, he's, he's working all things out, but I had a heart to follow God. Now, I had a plan, but God had another plan. And I think back on, on uh, going to Austin Chapel, and in 2016, I was, uh, I was put on the missionary committee for the ABA. And I felt like if anybody else would have been nominated, they would have beat me out for sure. Uh, because I was, I was unworthy to serve in that capacity. I feel unworthy to serve what I'm doing now. But that got me on the missions committee. Uh, long story short, Brother Roger Stewart, before he passed away that year at our committee meeting, he said, look, we need to have an emergency signer. Well, we look around the room, and guess who lives closest to Texarkana? I live 35 minutes out of Texarkana, pastoring in Austin Chapel in DeKalb. And so that naturally, I'm the closest. I'll be the emergency signer. And uh, I was on all the accounts one month before he passed away. We got my, names on the, my name on the account. And uh, God took it from there, and, and, and God was moving and working in my heart. I was very comfortable and very good at Austin Chapel. We were building a building. Our church was growing. God was doing great things. And two weeks before the national meeting, I had kind of heard that somebody else may be nominated for the position. And I'm like, yes, that's, a, that's perfect. You know, that'll be, that'll be great. And, uh, you know, I can just stay at, at Austin Chapel, and I can do my thing. Uh, and so me and the Lord had a lot of long discussions and talks, and uh, I wanted to pull my name out of that hat, but there, I just could not do that. Uh, and I feel confident that where I am, I don't know why God has put me there, but God has. And so I encourage you today, just be faithful where you are today and trust that God is working things. He's putting all the pieces together. You talked about that. Uh, and you never know how God is going to use you. And so that's a little bit about my story and uh, how I got where I am. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about our ministry real quick, and, and then we'll get to Acts chapter 13. Uh, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, you know, the Lord tells, he tells that church there that they are to begin in Jerusalem, and then they are to, they're, they're to go out and spread out from there, spreading the gospel. Uh, and, and there's a lot of scenes in the Bible. I wish I could have witnessed those scenes. One was at the tomb of Lazarus. I, I would have loved to have been there. Another is in Acts chapter 1 when Jesus Christ, can you imagine standing there as Jesus ascends into heaven and, until you can't see him anymore? I would have loved to have saw that, but then there was, they, they, were, they were just like me, just standing, gazing, looking up towards heaven where Jesus has ascended. And you know, those angels said, why are you gazing? You men of Galilee, why are you gazing? I, what I get from that is this. There was work that they needed to do. You can't just look up as Jesus has gone and even look for his return. We long for that. That's our hope. But listen, God has work for us to do. We begin at our Jerusalem, and then we spread out, and he's given us our marching orders. And someone said this. I don't know who it is, or I'd give them credit. But they said, why should anyone hear the gospel twice before everyone hears it once. And there are literally thousands of groups and places they've never heard a clear, concise presentation of the gospel. And the cry of my office is this, we need more. God's blessed us financially, but listen, we need more, we need more missionaries that will surrender to God's call and they will go wherever God is leading them, whatever the cost may be. And so how do, we, how do our churches carry out the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth? That's the commission that Christ has left us. 
Well, we do that through missions. We do that, and when, and when you support ABA missions, uh, you, you have a part in a lot of different things, and together we can do more. Uh, let me get to my slides real quick. I forgot about that. So the Thanksgiving missions offering. Uh, this is how important that offering is. This is from 2022. Without it, our office, we have a monthly deficit, and we would have had close to $190,000 deficit. But you see, with it, we had over $110,000 surplus. And so that offering is so important to us. Let's go to the next slide. This year, 325000 and praise the Lord, look at what we received. Over 346000 because of people like you, pastors like you, churches like you, uh, that have a heart for missions. You know, missions is the heartbeat of God. And that's got to be our uh, heartbeat as well. Let's go to the next slide. So this associational year, we have 147 missionaries serving through our office. And uh, the missionaries since July 1st, they've reported 4,171 professions of faith. Amen. They've reported 490, uh, or 472 uh, baptisms. Let's go to the next slide. Um, we have missionaries in 25 states, 29 foreign countries. <clears throat> 34 are interstate missionaries, and that just means U.S. citizens. Uh, who are serving and they're working in the United States. That's what an interstate missionary is. Uh, a foreign missionary, it's men working where they're not citizens. So uh, if a person from goes to Romania or whatever the case may be, uh, that, that's what we call a foreign missionary. A national missionary, those are men outside of the United States, but they're working in their country uh, that, that of their citizenship. Let's go to the next slide. We have one missionary helper, uh, 17 mission ministries. Uh, these, are, these are people like Tech Ministries, um, MacMed Ministries, uh, PMD is one of those mission ministries. Let's go to the next slide. That's just information on how to give. Uh, but, but here's the point with all of that. Together, we can do more. It takes everyone working together to do what God has left us here to do. Churches helping churches carry out the Great Commission. And so here's what it's about. It's not about building big uh, congregations or having a lot of people come. Here's what it's about. It's about that uh, little girl in Kenya that comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And one day she's in heaven with us, gathered around the throne, worshiping the Lord for all of eternity. When you give to ABA missions, you have a part when that little girl comes to Christ. That daddy in Baltimore who, uh, there's generational curses and, and uh, for generations and generations there's been uh, alcoholism and, and there's been some, some type of abuse. When he comes to know Christ and Jesus breaks all of that that has happened, and Jesus does that by the way, doesn't he? He has the power to do that. And when he comes to Christ and he turns his family around and his son becomes a missionary and, and uh, his daughter does some, all, all these awesome things for God, you have a part in that in ABA missions. And so um, what I do, um, <laughs> we, we really have no mission uh, through the office of secretary treasurer. Churches send out missions. I'm very clear, I'm not their boss. They don't answer to us in an office in Texas. They're sent out by local churches, on by the messengers at our national meeting, and our association is a voluntary association. Our office exists to help churches help their missionaries. That's what our office is for. In, in any way that we can assist. Well, but there's policy. Yes, there's policy. Because there's money involved, but you know who sets the policy? Not us. Our messengers at the national meeting. Uh, so, so there is that policy because you have to have guidelines uh, to, to operate under. Um, but my job really, I don't know. I'd probably spread 
tell you everything under the Office of Secretary Treasurer because there's the associational side of printing materials and yearbooks and church directories and keeping the website up to date. But I'm here just to talk on the mission side. And you can, you can really narrow it down to this. My job really is two part. Number one, it is my job to try to encourage our missionaries that are out there and they're serving. And every day I talk to missionaries uh, from all over the world. Uh, that, that we message or we talk on the phone. Uh, and so I encourage the missionaries, listen, they, they send in their reports to our office, and I do my very best to read every report. And I, and I try to respond to those reports, and I try to pray every, I pray every day for our missionaries. And then the second part of my job is to represent them because they're out there on the field, uh, they're, they're doing the work God has called them to do. And so I'm kind of on never-ending deputation. Uh, going to churches who invite me just to update and report and just tell what God is doing. And by the way, when I say that, I get excited because, listen, God is doing great things all over the world. God's doing great things in Texas. Uh, but God's doing great things, like I mentioned in Baltimore. God's doing great things in Mexico. I was just there two weeks ago. God's doing great things with our brethren in Costa Rica. God's doing great things in the Philippines. God is, do, God is moving and he's doing things all over. And we are so blessed and fortunate to have a part in what God is doing. That's my heart this morning. And so my door is always open. My phone uh, is always on. The things that I do, I write a monthly report. Uh, giving some of those stats that I just uh, gave to you. Um, two times a year we have missions, news, and views that come out. Uh, and so I, I kind of set a theme for that. Uh, I pick writers that I think God has laid on my heart. Uh, and then the boy from the cow pasture edits this thing <laughs> and uh, gets it printed. Over 10,000 copies of the missions, news, and views out twice a year. We have a spring edition, uh, which is at print right now and should mail out soon. And then we have a fall edition. Um, I travel quite a bit, uh, preach mission conferences, uh, preach at seminaries when I'm given the opportunity. Uh, mission recommendation forms are due to our office April the 19th, which is one week after I get home from the Philippines. Uh, that's, going to be, that's going to be a challenging week uh, after that type of trip. Uh, but I get those in and I sift through those and make copies and get everything ready for our Standing Missionary Committee meeting, which meets May the 20th and 21st uh, at Northern Hills in Texarkana. Uh, and so that's just a little bit and about what, um, what that job entails. Uh, as far as my travels, uh, I was in Costa Rica about a month ago. Um, I was in Mexico week before last. Um, we'll head to the Philippines this Sunday uh, afternoon. Um, and then I may, we may have a trip to Romania where I'll take my family and we'll check on missionaries there um, in the summer when they're out of school. And then in November, uh, I'll travel to Colombia and uh, check on works there and be able to, to preach some in their seminary. Uh, and so pray for me. Pray for my family. Uh, this is all new on all of us. And so just pray for us uh, in all of these changes and in all of these travels. And uh, I'd love to answer any question that you may have after this concerning the Office of Secretary Treasurer. All right, let's get to uh, Acts chapter 13. Uh, this morning, Acts chapter 13, and let's begin reading in verse 1. To challenge you this, this morning, I hope to encourage you today. But uh, Acts chapter 13 and verse 1, it says, Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger, and Lucius of Cyrene and Manion, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. 
And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at in the synagogues of the Jews, and they had also John to their minister. Let's skip on down to verse 12. And verse 12 says, Then the deputy, when he saw that was, that was do, what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. And so what I want to speak to you on this, this uh, morning is five phases of ABA missions. And uh, the mission of the church at Jerusalem, if you go back and you remember, we've already talked about Acts chapter 1 and verse 8. The mission at the church of Jerusalem was what? They were to begin in Jerusalem. They were to spread out to certain areas and then go to the uttermost parts of the earth. And by this time, when we get to Acts chapter 13, they've done a pretty good job at reaching Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria. But if you remember, there was a fourth step in the plan. And that was to reach the uttermost part of the earth. We find this about the church of Jerusalem. They had their prejudices. They had their hang-ups. They had their issues. And the Jerusalem church, they stubbed their spiritual toe on getting the gospel out to the entire world. They were comfortable and they... Uh, needed to be stirred. And by the way, that same commission, that's not just the church at Jerusalem, but that's our commission as well. To take the good news, the only news, the saving news of the gospel of Jesus Christ and to carry it to the uttermost parts of the, the world. And so persecution had pushed them out and God used that persecution uh, to get the gospel out. Listen, persecution never puts out the fire of the gospel. It always fuels the fire of revival. It always fans the fire uh, of revival. And so Antioch, we see Antioch in Acts chapter 13. Antioch was a very dynamic church. They were a visionary church. They, if you were to visit Antioch on a Sunday morning, you would see a very diverse congregation that assembled together for worship. When they came together, they were very diverse. And listen, uh, the, they reached out to all types of people. You can see it in their leadership in verse 1. Look at those that, that's mentioned in verse 1. You've got Barnabas. Well, Barnabas was a wealthy man from Cyprus. You've got Simeon or Niger. He was probably from Africa, and that is a Roman name. The next one we find is Lucius. He's probably a poor persecuted believer uh, who has fled to Antioch for safety. You've got Mannion. He is a higher class of society. And then you've got this guy named Brother Saul. We know who he is. He was known as being very religious, right? And so think about the diversity. You've got people. You've got poor people. You've got people of high class and high society. You've got religious people that make up, here in verse 1, the congregation at Antioch. And so these leaders, with their diversity of backgrounds and their social standings, they show how much the church at Antioch reached out. Listen, they reached out to all classes of people, and that's how we ought to be, Right? We, cannot, we can't uh, scatter seeds sparingly or pick and choose where we cast the seed, but we've got to preach the gospel to whosoever, regardless of their nationality, regardless of what side of the tracks that they came from, regardless of any of their social standing. We, we have to reach out. And that's the awesome thing about the gospel, isn't it? I hope you're thankful to be a preacher and a sharer of the gospel of Jesus Christ. There is no other message like the gospel. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. And listen, it doesn't matter what a person has done or where they've been. It's not who they are before they get to the cross. It's who Jesus Christ makes them to become. And so let's notice quickly five phases here of uh, mission work. God called, spirit-led, spirit-empowered, and church-sent missionaries. The first phase is the calling that we find in verse number 2. Look at verse number 2. It says, as they what? 
as they ministered to the Lord. I want you to get that, okay? They were faithful in ministry right where they were. They weren't sitting on their hands saying, I'm going to wait till God sends me somewhere cool and does something cool in my life. They were faithful right where they were. And listen, if we want God to use us in any type of capacity, we have to be faithful where God has us now, trusting that God has a plan for our lives. Notice they ministered to the Lord. That word means... It doesn't just mean to, to help out. It means to serve at one's own expense or to serve at one's own cost. They were serving sacrificially. Now, this word ministered of the Levites, it spoke of the sacred rites in the temple. But of Christians, it means this. They were worshiping the Lord. They were teaching. They were praying. They were instructing. They were serving, and they were honoring God. They were busy ministering to the congregation, and it was costing them something. Listen, serving God has to cost us something. You remember what Paul said in Romans chapter 12 and verse 1? Uh, he, he, talks about, uh, he talks about presenting our bodies as a, what? A living sacrifice. Now listen, here's the point. God may never call any of us to die for him but he's going to call all of us to live for him Amen. and to, to lay our all in sacrifice. And so here they are, they're ministering. Uh, notice, notice as verse 2 progresses, it says they fasted and they were praying. They were men of prayer and they were men of fasting. They set aside this basic need because they sensed the need to seek God's face in a special way. And so they're, they're pouring out to God to show, for God to show them his will for their lives. You know, many want to be backseat drivers in God's work where they say, I'll have the burden, you do the work. That's not how these guys were. Listen, God sends those who have a burden and a desire and are willing to work in his kingdom. That's who he sends. And listen, I hope your attitude today is, God, whatever you want for my life, whatever you want for my family, God, send me. God, do whatever you would have me to do. And let me leave everything on the field. Let me give it my all. And so they ministered, they prayed, they fasted. Verse 2 continues on. The Holy Ghost said, separate me Barnabas and Saul. Why not the other three? Well, this was God's plan. God had a plan for them, but he says, separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And so notice, God called them. God gave them a specific call from the Holy Spirit. The word separate means to set apart for the work that was chosen by God. He had a certain field of labor for them. It began for Paul in Acts chapter 9 when he is at his conversion. And the Lord said, I got plans for you. I've got to work for you. I've got something that I want you to do. And so listen, here's what, here's what the question ought to be for all of us this morning. What did God save me for? What did God save you for? And you say, well, I'm going to heaven when I die. Praise God. But listen, that's not, that's not all that God saves us for. There's a lot in between that and this. If that's all God saves us for, we're out of here, we're done. But he has, a purpose and he has a plan and he has a will. And I think about guys like Abraham, who God says, I want you to go. And he doesn't even know where he's going, but he packs his family up and he follows God, not even knowing where he's going. I think about Joshua when Moses dies. Listen, God has a Joshua that he raises up. And, and he says, be strong and be very courageous. As I was with Moses, I'll be with you. What do you think that did for young Joshua? Man, God is with me. And he says, no man will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. I'm going to do everything. You just put aside your thoughts and go where I tell you to go. You see, until we say no to the things that are keeping us from the will called by the church, 
They were not called by other leaders. They were not called by a committee. They were not called by a denomination. They were not called by an association. They weren't even called by themselves. called them through the power and the leading of the Holy Spirit. And God called them to go and to be a missionary to carry His Word. Let's notice, secondly, the sending. Look in verse 3. Verse 3, and, and when they had fasted and prayed, they, they bathed this mission in prayer and in fasting. And, it, and, and uh, you, you know, this is probably a prolonged thing where they're praying and they're fasting and they're seeking for God. They're seeking for the will of God, for the power of God, for the direction of God. And what they're saying is this, God, we are in full dependence on you. God, show us your will. God, show us what you would have us to do. Show us your timing. Show us your way. Why? So we can follow in that way. Notice in verse 3, it, the laying on of hands. They were commissioning them. This was a different sphere uh, of ministry for them. And they were identifying these two men as something different. Now they are being sent out. They are sent ones. Now, did that qualify them to be a missionary? God had called them to be a missionary. This identifies. This does not add any, any special ability to their bodies or anything else, but this just identifies and acknowledges their call, and they're saying, listen, we're behind you. We're committed. We're going to support you financially and through our prayers. And then notice in verse 3, they send them away. They dismiss them to go to their determined work. And by the way, sending is not a stamp, but it's an ongoing relationship between a church and a missionary. We're not just saying good luck and we'll see you later on. It's, it's an ongoing relationship. It is a, uh, it's, it's a cheering on. And then notice the third phase here is the going in verse 4. Now, in verse 4, it talks about Seleucia. Seleucia was a port, uh, a seaport of Antioch, and it was about 15 miles west of Antioch. Can you imagine the excitement and the conversation that took place? Maybe even the nervousness that took place as Paul and Barnabas are walking to this seaport 15 miles, and I'm sure Brother Barnabas looks over to Paul and says, man, people are going to accept Christ as we go. People are going to accept Christ as we go and as we do this. And maybe Brother Paul looks over at Barnabas and says, you know, there's going to be some hardships. There's going to be some battles. And Barnabas, the encourager, said, yeah, but God's going to do what God does. God's going to, God's going to work all of that out. God's going to use us. People are going to be saved. People are going to be baptized. The gospel is going to get out to the uttermost parts of the world. And so notice they're sent out by the Holy Spirit. They're not striking out on their own. They're not going because of a feeling. They're not going because, hey, this church said they'd send me and they voted, so we're going to go. They're not going because this is what they chose to do, but the source of their call and their mission was the Holy Spirit. And so God is the agent of sending, and the church is the instrument of sending. Think about this. It's God's call on your life. It's God's church who sins. It's God's Holy Spirit who sins. It's God's Holy Spirit who goes and empowers. And they were sent to reach the world and to preach the gospel and to teach the all things of the Lord. Listen to this. The missionary is the man of God, called of God, who goes sent by the church of God, preaching the gospel of God with the word of God, empowered and accompanied by the Holy Spirit of God to carry out the will and the work of God and fulfill the great commission of God. What do you get from all of that? It's kind of flashy, but here's what I get from it. It's all about God. It's all the Lord's, it's all His show. Bless Him if we're, if we're in it. <laughs> But it's not about us. 
It's about God. It's about all, everything is about God, and everything is for His honor and for His glory, and to God be the glory. Notice the fourth phase, preaching in verse 5. The primary work of missions is seen there in verse 5. They preach the Word of God in the synagogues of the Jews, and they also had John with them. But they preached the Word of God, and they made disciples. That's the Lord's command in Matthew 28, to go into all the world, to preach the gospel, to, to uh, baptize those who believe, to make disciples that will in turn go out, and they will spread the news. And what you've got more than addition to the kingdom of God, you've got multiplication to the kingdom of God. And it's an awesome thing, and it works. Notice they preach the word. We have a sure word of prophecy. I don't want to get sidetracked here, but it's the word of God people need to hear, not my opinion. Not our opinion as preachers of the word of God. It's alive. It's unchanging. Listen, people don't need more politics today. We've, we've got enough of those. People don't need more philosophy or more of this or more of that. We, we need to preach the Word of God. And listen, when we do that, we'll never have to back up. We can stand on it. We can lead our families by it. We can live by it, believing that every word is true. And I know prophecy will be fulfilled because of what has already been fulfilled. And then notice the fifth thing, believing. You see in verse 12, and we see, I can't imagine in verse 9 when Saul sets his eyes on this guy that they run into. I can't imagine for Saul to set his eyes on anybody. Uh, I wouldn't want him to set his eyes on me, but that's an intense moment. And notice in verse 11, he says, you're going to be blind for a season, and immediately he becomes blind. And then in verse 12, it tells us this, they were astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. But notice it says that some believed. And here's the point, and you know this, some are going to believe the message that you preach of salvation. Some won't believe. Some are going to wait. Some are going to wonder. But here's the point of ABA missions. Here's the point of everything that, that ought to make up our ministry. It is about heaven one of these days, and many more being gathered around the throne of God. And so missions must be supported, and our job is to obey. Now let me ask you this, are you living in obedience to God's call for your life? What is God calling you to do? What, what, is, what is God's will, and what is God's plan, and what is God's purpose in your lives? Because hopefully we can be like verse 36. David, after he served his own generation by the will of God, fell on sleep. <laughs> That's a beautiful picture to me. God, let me do everything that you called me to do, and then let me come to you. After he served his generation, I want to serve my generation well. And I think about Paul in Philippians chapter 4. And I know I've got to hurry here. But I think about Paul there in Philippians chapter 4 and verses... Uh, I'm sorry, Philippians chapter 3, verses 9 through 11. He says that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. In verse 12 he says, Not as though I'd already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which I'm also apprehended of Jesus Christ. What he's saying is, the Lord got a hold of me on that road to Damascus, and I want to fulfill everything that God has in store for me. Verse 13, he says, I'm not there yet. I haven't apprehended, but this one thing I do, my eyes on this prize. He says, I, I cease to be affected by what's behind. I don't want to enjoy yesterday's victories. I don't want to harp on yesterday's failures because we all have those in our past, don't we? I cease to be affected by those. And here's what Paul says, this one thing I do, I'm pressing toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. He says, I press. I'm keeping my eyes forward. Listen, he's worthy of us pressing on and keeping our eyes forward. You say, well, preacher, 
I think, you know, God had a will for my life, but now I think I've messed it up. <laughs> Listen, God's just like that GPS. He can reprogram us to get us to that destination. God's not through with you yet. Amen. Submit, surrender to his high call. Listen, he may be calling you across the ocean. He may be calling you somewhere in the United States. But may we answer his call as Isaiah did. Those five words, here am I, send me. Amen. You've got to answer God's will for your life. Well, listen, just hang on because it's, <laughs> it's a fun ride. It's a wild ride, but it's worth it. Yeah. Brother Steve, I'll close this. I'll, I'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for this seminary, for these that are gathered here today. And Lord, we just pray that you'd bless all of their ministries, that you'd bless all of our ministries. And Lord, we pray that we would give our all, surrender our all. Lord, we ask and we beg you to break our hearts for what breaks your heart. And Lord, we pray for a harvest. We pray that there'd be more laborers just as you've instructed us to pray. And God, we pray that there'd be many, many that would come to know you as their Lord and Savior because of the people that are in this room right now today. Lord, just use us for your honor and glory. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, really. You know, it's been a good week. We've heard a variety of topics from a variety of speakers that have told us things that somewhere in all that, each of us needed to hear some of that. Do you have any questions for Brother Wayne and Brother Justin? Yeah, about, about their work. Any, any, any questions at all? You can ask questions to Joe and Chase back there. They were uh, here earlier. Well, I pray it's been profitable for you. I, it has for me. It, it's taught me some things I needed to uh, needed to understand better. Thank you so much. I'm going to ask the two of y'all to come right down here, and we're going to have prayer for you and and your work. Just turn around right there, and if y'all come down, and we'll.